Okay, so this week we are just taking a look at Evicted. We don't have any other outside readings except for a quick article about um, trailer parks and mobile homes. So uh, the first chapters introduced us to Sharina and some of her tenants. And I want to start the videos this week by going through all of the stuff in the other set of storylines that takes place in Tobin Charney's trailer park. Um, I want to look at the trailer park and how it operates. And then in the next video, um, I'm going to talk about the role of government in all of this. And we have an exercise on that topic. So let's review the book up to this point. The book is doing two things at once. It is providing you with narratives of several families and, uh, as they deal with ev eviction. At the same time, we're hearing about the big picture that these stories ta are taking place in. The bigger picture of housing in Milwaukee and the United States in general. So on the narrative side, we've seen three families who rent from Sharina Tarver deal with eviction. Arlene and her sons have been evicted twice. Um, first, uh, from the first home, she was evicted because her son threw a snowball at a car and a lock was broken in a subsequent fight. And then she was evicted from her second home after it was declared unfit for human habitation. We've just also seen Lamar and his sons. Um, we see Lamar playing cards and smoking joints with his sons. And um, he gets evicted for doing a poor job on the work that he was doing in place of rent. And notice, by the way, that there's a parallel here between the way that um, Sharina runs her properties and Tobin runs his, in that there are a lot of informal agreements, um, you know, not things that are done in writing, but just verbal agreements. And the terms of the agreement seem to shift as the landlord sees fit. So, um, you know, Sharina is pulling this thing on Lamar where suddenly it's like, well, that job isn't good enough. We also saw in the first chapters, Patrice Hingston and her children and her grandchildren um, were served a, a, a eviction notice. And then after we uh, spend some time in the trailer park, we'll get more detail about that family. On the big picture side, we see that stories like this are not only very common, but they are a huge factor in uh, eviction, in the creation of poverty in general, right? So we get statistics like the majority of poor renting families in America spend over half of their income on housing. Um, and Landlords in Milwaukee evict 16,000 adults and children each year. And the, the conclusion that Desmond draws from this is that we have failed to appreciate how deeply housing is implicated in the creation of poverty. And in what we're going to see um, in these chapters, uh, we'll go into more detail about that, all the ways in which it's not just a big problem, but a huge factor in the creation of other problems. So in the trailer park, we also get stories of evictions. And uh, first off, there is Lorraine Jenkins. Um, she, she gets an SSI check for um, $714 and she pays $550 of that in rent. Again, matching what we saw before, most of people's incomes goes to rent. She fell behind on vent, rent and essentially made a, made a plea deal in eviction court, um, but she stopped paying her rent when it looked like the trailer park was going to be shut down because uh, the city council, which is called the common council here, um, had declared it an environmental hazard. Lorraine winds up talking to the press about drugs and prostitution in the trailer park and as a result gets another eviction notice. Um, and uh, this is a part of a, this is the same kind of pattern we saw in Sharina's properties on the north side, uh, retaliation for reporting on problems. Tobin agrees to call off this eviction when uh, Lorraine promises to come up with another $150. Um, 
So basically what we're seeing um, is, is that a lot of things on the in the white trailer park work the same way as they do on the black north side. Um, we see retaliations. Um, we see in um, we see informal agreements that keep changing. Um, one thing that we do see that's different that you should have noted when we, I was we were doing that exercise I called comparative landlord studies is that Tobin's tenants are oddly loyal to him. They say he's not a bad person. And some of this seems to be coming from the fact that the residents of the trailer park define themselves um, as better off than the people on the Black North Side. And the thing that they are most afraid of is having to move to a black neighborhood. The, and the thing that they want to keep asserting is that where they live now is not a ghetto. They are not like those other people. Okay, so Lorraine's eviction was pure retaliation. There's another story about Pam and Ned, which uh, is Ill illustrative, right? So Tobin strikes a deal with the Common Council to evict nuisance tenants. And this includes Ned and Pam who are drug dealers um, and users. Uh, they thought they owed $1,800, so they sign over their Obama stimulus check to the landlord, which is $1,200. And then Tobin says they actually owe $3,000. Um, and we are told specifically right here that Tobin rarely makes deals in writing and often misrepresents how, many, how much people owe. In any case, he takes the stimulus check and then evicts them anyway. An eviction is, turns out to be contagious. After Pam and Ned are evicted, they move in with Scott and Teddy. But because Scott and Teddy are now in violation of their rental agreement, Tobin evicts them. And so this is uh, one of the bigger patterns that we start to see. Eviction isn't just a hardship in itself. It generates other hardships. And in the subsequent chapters, we'll go into more detail about this. But basically, eviction destabilizes whole communities. It keeps individuals from getting the footing they need to get their lives together. And it keeps communities from getting the foothold that they need to get their collective lives together. Another big picture theme that comes up in this section is the idea of control of land as a form of social power. People like Sharina and Tobin have power because they control the space that people live in. The city council in Milwaukee, the common council, has declared the trailer park an environmental hazard and is threatening it to shut it down. So Tobin responds in part by evicting um, nuisance tenants like um, Ned and Pam. This is how Desmond describes this reaction. When city or state officials pressured landlords by ordering them to hire an outside security firm or by having a building inspector scrutinize their property, landlords often passed the pressure on to their tenants. There was also a matter of reasserting control. The most effective way to assert or reassert ownership of land is to force people from it. And then there's an interesting footnote here. So this is on page 45. And then he says in a footnote, on the link between sovereignty and expulsion, see Hannah Arendt on the origins of totalitarianism. Hannah Arendt was a Jewish philosopher um, in the middle of the 20th century in Germany, and then when she couldn't be in Germany anymore, the United States. Uh, and she wrote about her experiences with totalitarianism in Germany, comparing it extensively with Stalin, totalitarianism in Stalinist Russia. Um, so there's an interesting connection that Desmond is making here between control of land by landlords and control of land in, in, by state, by, by, you know, the governments of countries. Um, so the reference to origins of totalitarianism is pretty broad. I mean, it's a huge book and he just says, see this book. I, I decided to take a look in it uh, to see what might be relevant here. 
Uh, and one thing that happens is in chapter 9, Arendt discusses the mass denaturalizations that occurred under fascism. For instance, millions of Jewish people were declared non-citizens, right? Um, the government always has a right to expel people. That's generally taken to be something that governments can do. But in totalitarian regimes, this power is completely unleashed. So what you see in Hitler's Germany was that millions of Jewish people became non-citizens. And this becomes a refugee crisis after World War II, where millions are left stateless and living in internment camps. And it's interesting, you might think that, you might not recognize why not having a citizenship in any government is a bad thing. But remember, governments on our modern conception are created to secure people's rights. The government exists to protect your rights against other people. Um, and if you have no state, you effectively have no right. So, um, th that there's this theme. Landlords have power because they control territory. Um, you expel people from territory to assert your control over it. And that's just an important and central piece of the power dynamic that is going on here. There's actually another difference between the trailer park and the rental units that Sharina runs on the north side. And this has to do with the financing of it all, because uh, very often the residents of Tobin Charney's trailer park own their trailers. They own their mobile homes, and, but they don't own the land underneath it. John Oliver, with a comedy show last week tonight, actually did a really great piece, a great episode, unpacking the economics of trailer parks. And I was originally just going to have you watch some excerpts of it, but I have discovered that HBO doesn't like that, and uh, they actually have digital spies that can identify their content. So um, I'm just going to put up a link, and you can watch the whole thing. Um, the important part that I want you to pay attention to, though, and the part that I would have focused your attention on if uh, I had just been excerpting it, is the way in which Tobin Charney's trailer park, where he offers a handyman special that lets you own the house and not the land underneath, um, is actually a, a financially ruinous idea. Um, and John Oliver goes into great detail about um, how much of a scam this is, especially in the hands of another guy named Frank Rolf, who runs some trailer parks. But the good news is that, um, well, the good news comes in a, a Vice article that I've put up a link to right after the John Oliver um, episode, um, where, in fact, some residents of a trailer park the owned by Frank Rolf, um, get together and buy the park from him. So that's the next thing you need to watch.